Okay. We're going to be talking about a interesting story today that's in our Bibles, that's in the Jesus movies, if you've seen those. There's a man we're going to be talking about today. A man that often, if before we go into this, you might have no idea who he is. Simon of Cyrene. Um, Bright just me saying that you might not even know off the top of your head who that is. Simon of Cyrene. Well, in the three times that he's mentioned ever in our Bibles, he only has one verse for himself. Just one verse. And so today's study is going to be one verse. Turn to Luke 23, verse 26. Luke 23, 26. And when they led him away, they took hold of a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country, and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. That's it. He's known for carrying Jesus' cross after they led him out to be crucified. And we never hear from him again. Never do we hear from this man again. But before we go into what... Whenever this man shows up, it's just sudden. They just took a man from the crowd, had, Je had him carry Jesus' cross. But why don't we get some backstory on where we were on the last time we were in Luke... Jesus is declared guilty before Pilate, right? Remember? And uh, they release a terrorist, Barabbas. And he would murder people. He was a robber and an insurrectionist. And they released him. And they handed over Jesus to be crucified. And that's just innocent blood right there. Guilty. But before they led Jesus out to be crucified, what they did is they uh, sent him off to be scourged. A Roman flogging. Roman floggings were severe. And uh, it's not a light thing to receive a Roman scourging. It would be they would tie you up to a, a post, arms, everything. And they would uh, just whip you front and back. And this whip particularly had sometimes a metal attached to the whip at the top. And they would also have bones attached on the top of this whip. So whenever it would, you know, hit you, it would take meat off of your body. It would take the very skin off of your body. It would go and it would take. Why don't I give you a physiology of what Jesus' health looked like before they even gave him a cross to carry? What did this Roman flogging do to our Lord? You should know it because what I'm going to read, it should have been you and I that faced these symptoms. As I'm reading these symptoms, I want you to understand that it should have been you. During that Roman flogging, Jesus' back would have been dug open, visible. His rib cage would have been visible from the back. It wasn't some movies depict just scratches on the back. But this would likely have been an open back uh, to the point where you could see internal organs. Blows to the upper back and rib area caused rib fractures. Severe bruising in the lungs with the lungs lacerated because, as I said, the back's dug open. You could be 
hitting internal organs at that point. As much as 125 milliliters of blood could be lost, the victim under a Roman flogging would periodically vomit. Experience tremors and seizures and have bouts of fainting. Each excruciating strike would elicit shrieks of pain. It should happen to us. Don't read it, don't listen to this as mere intellect. This is what you and I deserve. This is the bare minimum of what we deserve. The victim would be profusely sweaty and exhausted. And they would crave water because of the exhaustion. Crave water. Jesus would have been in hypovolemic shock. What does that mean? It's the traumatic state your body enters whenever you lose, whenever you lose a significant amount of blood. Fractured ribs would make breathing painful and the victim would only be able to take short, shallow breaths. Nothing deep, nothing with your whole chest because you, if you want to take a deep breath, guess what's happening? Those lungs are piercing against bones. Fractured bones. Now, on top of that, they scourge him, and then in Mark's and Matthew's gospel, it says they gathered the whole Roman battalion, 600 men, a whole cohort of Roman soldiers right here in front of Jesus, and they begin to mock him. This is where the crown of thorns came in. They take the crown of thorns, and they uh, put it on his head, and they dig it there. And this, you guys know what a wreath is, right? For Christmas, you know, they hang on the door. This likely would not have been a wreath. I mean, they don't have enough time to maybe just put together and it's sort of more of a cap of crowns, I believe. Okay? This is more of like a big set of a cap that you would put on someone's head. And as if that crown of thorns just growing in your head isn't enough. Mark and Matthew say that in his scourged condition already, they took a reed of a plant, a reed which is firm, and began hitting his head. So one like that, one this way, one that way. And guess what? Where those thorns would have gone? Deeper into his head. Deeper into Jesus Christ. Head. Irritation of the nerves in the head by the crown of thorns would have caused a condition called trigeminal neuralgia. This condition causes severe facial pain that may be triggered by light touching, swallowing, eating, talking, temperature changes, and even exposure to the wind. Because you're striking the nerve. You're striking a nerve, and that strikes. Some people have root canals and they can't stand the pain. Why? Why? You're hitting a nerve. You're hitting a nerve. And that could cause striking pain if you hit a nerve. Stabbing pain radiates around the eyes, over the forehead, the upper lip, nose, cheek, the side of the tongue, and the lower lip. Some say it is the worst pain that anyone can experience. How would this have felt like, you know, jamming these thorns into the nerves of his head? Some people said the pain would have been like a lightning shock, an ex electric shock. If you've been electrocuted with any extent, it's just like a, you know, flashes of pain, flashes of heat, flashes of, you know, it's unbearable. That's what it would have been feel like and, a, and another quote says this as a soldier struck jesus on his head with reeds he would have felt excruciating pain across his face and deep into his ears much like the sensations from electric shock these pains would have been felt all the way to calvary while he was carrying the cross as he walked and fell as he was pushed and shoved 
as he moved any part of his face, just even moving his lips, even taking a breath, even when a slight breeze, you know, pressed against his face, new waves of intense pain would have been triggered. The pain would have intensified his state of traumatic shock. Let's not take it lightly, guys, when we sin against him. Remember this. Remember this. That's everything before our text today. And on top of that, after that, Pilate never ordered that they would put a crown of thorns and they hit his head. They never or Pilate never ordered such a thing. This was just brutality uh, of a weird kind because Jesus had nothing against the Romans. There were not many Roman interactions. This was just all of a sudden making fun of the guy beating him badly. And then all of a sudden they place a cross on Jesus and they lead him off to be crucified. How much do you guys think this cross would have weighed? Any guesses? 200 pounds. It was over 100 pounds. Over about 100 pounds of weight. Whenever you just received the Roman scourge. <laughs> Imagine if you were in good health and you would have, you're having to carry this thing, you know, down streets, up hills. In Jerusalem, whenever they would crucify somebody, what they would do is they would have the whole city gather on a road, all on the left side, all on the right side, and they would have the person about to be crucified going down that road, and they would have the entire city watch that person be crucified going down that road. Why? Because it would intimidate the people. It would be a way of saying, if you go against Rome, this is what's happening to you. And people knew that person on that road, down that, down those streets, all the way to wherever they would crucify the person, that's a one-way journey. They would not come back alive. It just wouldn't happen. And they would make it public to intimidate the people. This street was called the Via Dolorosa. The Via Dolorosa. This road that Jesus walked down. You could search it up today. Um, it's obviously not on the same foundation as the old Jerusalem, but they have an idea. Um, somewhere along the Via Della Rosa, Jesus was actually unable to carry the cross. And he needs help. He needs help. He, as he's carrying this cross, these Roman soldiers are very brutal, as you can see by the crown of thorns and everything that they did to him. They're probably kicking him and pushing him and whipping him and doing all these things in this entire process. And he must have been falling down. And they must have, you know, pulled him back up or whatever. Just he, on his own force and might, would have pulled himself back up. But then all of, this, all of a sudden, the Roman soldiers feel the need to grab somebody from the crowd. They're not the most kind people. They actually urgently, because it says they took hold of a man, other gospel says they seized him, and they got someone from the crowd to help Jesus. Why do you think they did this? Any, what do you guys think? What are your thoughts as to why they urgently go and grab a man? Out of compassion? Out of what do you guys think? No thoughts? Any thoughts? Trying to grab the man to carry Jesus up? Yeah. So they as in the Roman soldiers. In the Roman soldiers. Um, I think so that the cross would fall and break. Okay. That's a that's a thought. Maybe it was like a prideful thing. Well, Matthew Henry, the commentator, says this. Upon looking at Jesus' condition, they probably thought that Jesus was dying. They probably thought that Jesus was dying before they let him out to be crucified. 
Remember, they have one job right now. What is it? Crucify that man. You don't have a great task. You just lead him off and you, you know, put those nails in him and done. That's your job. How do you think Pilate would have felt? How do you think Pilate would have treated these soldiers if he, find, if he finds out that they killed the man before they let him out the crucifixion? He would probably kill them. He would probably kill them or violently torture them. So they, them grabbing a man from this crowd it's probably because they thought Jesus is a... This guy's about to die, actually. They probably thought this is over for Christ. He was that bad of... He was in that bad of a condition. And they grab one man. A man named Simon. Simon of Cyrene. This man is mentioned three times in our Bible. Outside of this incident of carrying the cross, he's never mentioned again. Cyrene is a city... Uh, in North Africa, Libya, okay? North Africa. Many have said that Simon was a black man. And he was African. Dark man. Could be, but we don't know. He was a Hellenistic Jew. What's a Hellenistic Jew? It's a Jew with Greek influence. A hundred thousand Jews from Palestine had been settled in Cyrene ever since 300 BC, around there. So this territory of Cyrene in northern Africa was actually populated by Jews. And the Cyrenian Jews even had a synagogue in Jerusalem for such, um, so that they can come to their annual feasts, right, for Passover. And there's this man, it says he was coming in from the countryside. I mean, what is he coming here for? Why is he coming to Jerusalem? For Passover, right? It's Passover season. That's why people would come. Everyone would come. Even Jesus came. That was the thing. You had to celebrate Passover at Jerusalem. That was God's, you know, prescribed thing that they had to do. And as Simon is passing by, Mark calls him a passerby. A uh, passerby. The Roman soldiers seize him out of all the people and press him into the crowd to carry the cross for Jesus. There are no words ever recorded of a conversation between Jesus and Simon. But I think there would have been a look with Jesus and Simon. A look. Jesus' exhausted, blood-showered face would have just looked at Simon. If we know our Bibles well, Isaiah 52 has a description of Jesus, which says this, As many were astonished at you, his appearance was marred beyond human semblance. What does that verse mean? After they had brutally scourged, flogged Jesus, he barely looked human. That's what the verse is saying. He was marred beyond human semblance. Wow, imagine, that's, a, that's an accurate description from God. That's not an over-exaggeration. If you were to see him, you would be thinking, what is that that I'm looking at? Who is that? He barely looked like a human. I mean, the amount of blood... Would have, that would have showered from his head. You would think this is a fountain of blood from his head. And I would think there was just a look between Jesus and Son. No words are exchanged. I don't think Jesus is in a place to even get some words across at this moment because he has fallen down. And the worst part is this cross of 100 pounds would have fallen on him. Press him down to the ground. Movies, what do movies show? If you remember any movies of a scene like this, what do movies depict? Simon and Jesus carry the cross together, right? A man comes in, Simon is holding one part of the cross, and Jesus is holding another part of the cross, right? That's typically what you see. I'm afraid that's not accurate. They are not cooperating. 
because you know why I think that's a not the most accurate depiction of Jesus and Simon carrying the cross together all the way up to Golgotha because I think that doesn't depict Jesus' health properly that shows that Jesus was in a place of cooperation right it shows that he's somewhat able to bear that much weight no I, I believe he was he was near approach approaching death uh, on this road uh, I think there would have been a, a, a red it, it would have looked like red paint all over the street he was done the soldiers knew that Jesus needed uh, some person to carry the entire cross by himself they knew that cooperation was not needed why do I say that I believe that Simon, from this point, it was only Simon carrying the cross. Because our verse in Luke 23, 26 says this. Um, and they placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. What does that tell you? He's carrying the cross behind Jesus. So he's looking at Jesus walking without a cross. And now Simon is carrying the whole thing. Yeah. Did they meet the other two that got crucified with Jesus also carry their cross? They did. At the same time? At the same time. Because it says in verse 32, Now two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. Did they get beat up prior as well? That was the tradition. That was the tradition. But theirs, uh, Jesus' treatment was far worse because... Um, whenever Jesus dies and they report to Pilate that Jesus is dead, Pilate gets surprised because normally a man on the cross would stay there for a couple of days, a few days. Jesus died in a few hours. And so his, his treatment was uh, fairly bad. Do you guys think Jesus was a health, healthy person before this or no? I mean, he was poor, so he probably didn't eat too much food, but... I'm sure like he he cared about what he ate I, th I think he was you know I don't think I'm me personally I he was an athletic person you know on his feet I and people like they you know they're they're exercising all day long you know taking care of his body I think something Jesus would have surely done and for a healthy man he's near death right there he's near death Critical condition. But, and Simon would have gone all the way to Golgotha. And that's all we ever hear from him. We don't ever hear another Bible verse about Simon. Neither is he mentioned ever in church history either. No early church documents even mention the guy's name. Why is this mysterious man in our Bible? What can we learn? From this man what do you guys think I don't want to hear anything why is he here and he never is mentioned again all we hear is they pull the guy out of the crowd carry this cross and that's it he's supposed to show how discipleship is Supposed to, supposed to show how discipleship is supposed to be. Okay. Yeah, I mean, again, it's a picture. It sounds like Jesus' words, right? You know, take up your cross, follow me. And that's what Simon was doing. Yeah, a lot of people have made those references. But I want us to understand this. What ended up happening with Simon? If we look at this verse we don't really know what ended up happening with him can someone read mark 15 21 now let's hear let, let, upon reading this i want you guys to think what what ended up happening with simon mark 15 21 a certain man from Cyrene, simon the father of alexander Lucius was passing by on his way from the country and they forced him to carry the cross okay what's the detail men mentioned in mark's gospel that matthew and luke don't mention that they 
the fourth group of carriers. No. The father, the, the, the father of Alexander and Rufus. The father of Alexander and Rufus. Oh, why do you guys think that's mentioned? I mean, he's never mentioned again, ever. Simon's never mentioned again, ever. But why do you think Mark adds that in parentheses, the father of Alexander and Rufus? Can someone read Romans 16, 13? Romans 16, 13. Great Rufus, children in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Oh, sorry, greet Rufus. Yeah, you want to read that one more time? Yeah. Greet Rufus, children in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. So he's a believer. So what happened with some? He became a believer. Because there's only one Rufus ever mentioned in our entire Bible. And it's in Romans 16. And that's why Mark is writing to a Roman audience, right? Mark's gospel was actually written to a Roman audience. And he says, Paul says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Other translations say, a choice man in the Lord. Also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Wow. Simon's wife would have been like a mother figure to the apostle paul he became a believer on this fateful day simon picked up his cross and never put it back down simon of cyrene never stopped bearing his cross simon began by physically following christ but died spiritually following christ Simon would have come to know that Jesus was, that he, Simon would have come to know that he was not carrying the cross of a criminal that day, but rather that he was carrying the cross of God himself. John MacArthur says this, It may have been the carrying of Jesus' cross that led Simon to faith in him. What began as a forced and probably resented act of physical servitude became the opportunity for spiritual life. Not only Simon himself, but his entire family came to salvation. And his wife became like a mother to the Apostle Paul. Wow. The word Cyrene is mentioned in the book of Acts more often than it is in the Gospels. Acts 11.20 says this, But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. Well, Simon's name is not mentioned there, but I think there's a great possibility that Simon was one of those people preaching the Lord Jesus, right? To the Hellenists. Wasn't he a Hellenistic Jew, right? Greek influence, but he's a Jew because he's coming to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. That's how we know he's a Jew. And he's preaching to Hellenistic Jews as what he was formerly. And we could probably assume that Simon was there in that verse in Acts 11, 20. You might say, you know, this is, this is wonderful, great. You know, I didn't know this. He got saved. But what can we, us four, take away from Simon's story? What are your guys' thoughts? What can we personally take away from this story? What is there to learn from here? Do we not read about many people in the Bible getting converted? What's so special about this? Could God not have not mention Simon, like John's gospel. John's gospel doesn't mention Simon. Couldn't all four gospels not mention him? Does not, isn't the mentioning of Simon of Cyrene something that's important to each one of us individually, right? Because God doesn't mention things that are not fruitful to us. What are your thoughts? Any thoughts, any brainstorming? Right, it doesn't have to be right, wrong, anything. Why is he here? 
Great, he became a Christian. Well, didn't the thief on the cross? Didn't the Philippian jailer? Didn't Mark and Timothy lie to Simon? What do you guys think? It's a confusing story. It's just like, it was forcing you to think. Because staring at this text, I was just like, what on earth is there about this guy? God knew that this might have been his last opportunity to repent. Okay. So he put him in that situation strictly so he can come to faith. Mm -hmm. Because, like you mentioned, he's not in the Bible. Like you have mentioned other places. So this is probably the only time an encounter he would have had with Christ. And who knows what happened or what interaction him and Jesus had, if they had any. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a thought. I want I want us to put it all on the table. Good, that's good thinking. This stuff, passages like this force you to think. Isn't it beautiful that God doesn't mention stuff by accident? Mm -hmm. That means whenever if something is mentioned, you can profit from it. I was gonna say that that day Simon didn't know that he would do that, and um, obviously. Like God opening that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want us to think here. What details are mentioned about this man? Can, let's just list them off. For like, here's what I mean. Name, right? His name is mentioned. It could have been. By the way, it could have said just this. They pulled a man from the crowd to carry his cross, right? But doesn't God find it important to mention his name? We don't get the name of the thief on the cross, right? But God mentions his name. What else does he mention about Simon? Where he's from. Where he's from. What else? That he was coming from the country. That was from, coming from the country. His mother. His, his, Romans 16 does. But yeah. His soldiers what, seize him. They seize him. They seize him. Take hold of him. That's a violent grabbing of a man. Those are the details that are mentioned for us so that we can benefit from his life. You understand? Those details are not blurted out by accident. Never read your Bible that way to say, oh, I'm just going to look over it. God want you, wanted you to know he was from Simon, Northern Africa. And that they grabbed him violently. And the next verse, what does it say? Can someone read verse 27 of Luke? A large number of people followed him, including women who mourn. Right there, right there. Okay. We don't want to get to next week. <laughs> it says that a large multitude of people were following him, right? How many people would be in Jerusalem at this time? Thousands. Yeah, about a million. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Packed. All the Jews all around the world would come to Jerusalem in Passover. They had to be in Jerusalem. The population would triple. There is one doctrine that is predominantly set on display in this story. One doctrine. I'm going to write down some of some doctrines on the board. And um, I would want you guys to maybe, if we know these doctrines well, to maybe think of what it could be. We are well aware of the, the doctrines of grace, right? Or you can call it Calvinism. There are five doctrines um, that I would like to talk about. Um, the first one is uh, total depravity. And as you're thinking about this story, um, I want you to think what doctrine would fit the details that we just read. It's not your is it irresistible grace. Um, <laughs> Uh, 
<laughs> you want to laugh? Mm -hmm. She's like, you can't answer. Can't answer it. And the last one is perseverance or preservation of the saints. Doctrine is important, guys. Theology yeah, is important. Big stats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very important for us to know theology, all right? It's important for us to be acquainted, acquainted with doctrine because it matters. This story, we get Simon's background. He was from Cyrene, Northern Africa. He was coming in from the country. He didn't volunteer to help Jesus, but rather he was pulled into the crowd. There's a doctrine that fits this story well, and it is uh, irresistible grace. Irresistible mm -hmm. grace is this doctrine. What is irresistible grace? Does anyone know? What is the doctrine of irresistible grace? You mean you can't resist God's election. You cannot resist God's election, okay? So God, before the foundation of the world, chose a specific amount of people to be saved. A few, the elect, he called, he predestined the elect to come to salvation. But there are people that are not elected. Whenever the gospel is preached, the elect can never, ever not come to salvation. Why? What are some verses of this? All that the Father gives me what will come to me right all that the father chooses they will come to jesus that's irresistible grace all that god elects will come to salvation john 6 44 no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him draws them uh, james 1 18 of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. Now I want you guys to understand this. That Simon is a man from northern Africa. That's a great distance away from Jerusalem. What if he left one day late? What if he left one day early? What if he got there on Thursday and not Friday? What if? He was coming in from the country. If there was any place that people could maybe talk to him, it would maybe be in the open country. Because once you're in the city, man, it's a packed place. And it says, the scripture says, the large crowds of people were following Jesus. Large crowds of people were following him. A million, about a million people would be in Jerusalem at this time. And no one is volunteering to help Jesus. Not one person is volunteering to help him. They seize him into the crowd, and he happened to be there at the right time, at that very day, at that very hour, at that very minute, at that very second. And Mark describes him as someone who was passing by, right? He wasn't watching. He was passing by. Jesus' health failed at the exact moment where Simon was near him. Do you not see this? I There was nothing, there's no indication in all the scriptures that we hear about the people seeing Jesus crucified, saying, oh, pick me, pick me. You know, let me help carry his cross. People didn't want to do this. They didn't want to be involved. You think Simon would want to be involved? No, he would not want to be involved in a scene like this. That's why they had to, they had to grab the man. But I want us to understand this. What I just mentioned to you, irresistible grace. I'm afraid something just happened. I'm afraid I just explained this doctrine to you. It went into your head and you have no affection for me. I'm afraid that happened. 
It just went into your intellect and you could care less because it just was an intellectual thing. I'm afraid that happens to all of us. Where it's just, I know what it is. Or if I didn't know, now I know now. And it's mere knowledge now. Irresistible grace. In fact, these doctrines are supposed to be the most heartwarming doctrines. Our church is not fully on board with all of them. Our church is on board with irresistible grace. And I think it's absolutely essential as people who attend this church for us to know irresistible grace. And not just know it, but cherish it. And to love it. If you lack a love for it, may I explain to you more of what this doctrine is? Let me ask you guys something. Do people resist the gospel? Do people reject God? Before we were converted, did we reject God, the gospel, and Jesus Christ? In fact, it says in Acts 7.51, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Scripture is full of verses talking about how God's grace is resistible. Can we resist God's grace? Yes. You, it says you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. Scripture is full of verses that say that the non-believer is resisting God. It's not that the elect before conversion are any special. So what does it mean? What does it mean? Irresistible grace. What does the doctrine mean in a way where we cherish it? You know what it means? It means that whenever God pleases, He overcomes your resistance. Whenever God pleases, He overcomes your resistance against Him, His Son, and the Gospel. Many people describe salvation as uh, Jesus coming to the sinner's heart and knocking. Oh, come on in, open the door. That's not salvation. You know what salvation is? Jesus comes to your life and breaks the door of your heart down and says, you are mine now. You're mine. Do you still not cherish it? Let me say this. If God never initiated in your life, you would still be resisting to live till this very day. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God in His kindness looked upon you and out of the thousands of people around you who are not Christians, He chose to overcome your resistance. But he allows the people around you to still keep on resisting. You think about that? Does that not frighten you in gratefulness? That he resisted my, he overrided my resistance. No one can come to me unless the Father draws them, right? The Father chose to draw you. And leave your family member in their sins. You don't think it could have been the other way around? How many people? There's Are there not people in your life who you've preached the gospel to over and over and over again? And they're still non-believers? Guess what? That could have been me. Could have been me. You didn't get your act together and stop rebelling. No. You rebelled and rebelled and rebelled and rebelled even more. But one day, because God elected you before the foundation of the world, he said, enough. I'm going to set my mercy on you. You're mine. And I'm going to love you forever. He initiated that. 
But there's people all around us, till this day, they've just heard the gospel, hardened their heart to it, and are probably sealed for damnation. Providence and the sovereignty of God brought Simon into this story. MacArthur says, the soldier's choice of Simon may seem random, but in reality, it was anything but random. God's invisible hand was sovereignly at work, providentially using the witless actions of Roman soldiers to draw this bystander to saving faith. Simon thought that he was helping Jesus, but in reality, Jesus was helping Simon. Simon thought this was just coincidence, accident, and the moment. But Jesus was waiting all of eternity for that moment. All of eternity. We were singing today in worship. That was a song that came up. It says, Lord, why have you made me a guest? And the lyrics went on to speak about how I could have been like the thousands of other people who resist you and starve and go to hell. Why did you make me a guest? Why me? Young people die and go to hell. That could have been me right now. You think about it? There's people who were young, died, entered a lake of fire, and that's it for them. Just because we've never experienced that doesn't mean that's not an active reality that happens to people all the time. Never, ever allow your doctrine to be mere intellect. But may you melt in gratefulness to the Lord Jesus Christ when he could have left you in your sins. But he initiated the encounter. And he said, no. Though the hundreds of thousands around this individual are resisting, I am going to lay my mercy on this one person. One very few people ever experience irresistible grace. And if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he chose to override your rebellion. Let us cherish him then, because we're not in the lake of fire right now. He chose to set his love on you, and he adopted you into his family. Whereas the other people around you, possibly your neighbors and co-workers, will actually live to be 80 and die and go to hell. But not so with you, believer. He's waiting for that day to see you and to hold you in his arms. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, out of all the people, why me? Why us? We're grateful that you have loved us this way and that you have when we were rebelling you when we were rebelling against you Jesus why did you choose us and leave the people around us still in their sin this gift that only a few people ever get in human history you have given to us Please don't you dare not change our life this upcoming week. Don't allow this to slip our mind that you've done this act for us. I just ask that the rest of this time that we can just glorify you in any way for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. That's the story of Simon.